Hello, welcome to the Friday, April 2nd, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. And we got again one of Brad's famous quizzes. Now, uh, this time he goes beyond uh, the actual packed captures and has sort of an entire little forensics challenge for you. You can download uh, the evidence uh, from Brad's GitHub repository. And well, uh, this month we also have a prize for you. More details about how to submit your answer and what the exact questions are, you can find in the diary. The prize will be a raspberry pi and uh, please submit your answer before well brad's answer is being posted in about a week and we will then select sort of randomly among the correct answers the winner of the raspberry pi and unlike Brad's sort of guest in his diary it's actually a new raspberry pi 4 that we'll be giving away and remember CoinHive? CoinHive was a company that set up a service that made crypto jacking really easy by offering JavaScript that you could inject into a browser to mine Monero with CoinHive's help. About two years ago, CoinHive was dismantled. The domain no longer resolved in part because of legal pressure, because a lot of these scripts, of course, were used for legitimate purposes. Turns out that uh, Troy Hunt was uh, given access to domains related to CoinHive, and he's now trying to notify remaining victims. Just uh, by essentially allowing the domain to resolve again, he was able to see that there are still uh, many, many sites out there that remain compromised by the CoinHive script. So what he started doing now is to actually inject a little pop-up box into these sites by essentially serving his JavaScript instead of the original CoinHive JavaScript and notifying visitors that the site is compromised and trying to launch a crypto coin miner. The hope is to eventually alert, of course, system administrators for these sites and have these sites cleaned up. It's, of course, very likely that there is other malicious content in these sites, given that they apparently have not been cleaned in the last two years. And when we're talking about living off the land attacks, then one of the hackers' favorite tools in the Windows world tends to be BITS, the Background Intelligent Transfer Service, an agent that's installed on all Windows systems in order to download updates. But it's also used by a number of other processes. The trick here is that uh, an attacker will use bits to essentially just send a request to a random website in order to download, for example, additional malware. FireEye now has an interesting blog post where they are looking closer at the bits activity and how to detect what an attacker probably did with bits bits has a database where it sort of tracks its activity it's not easily accessible but uh, fireeye now wrote a tool that they open sourced that will allow you to parse that database and essentially figure out and recover what an attacker did with this tool and as FireEye points out, the Ryak ransomware recently has also been found to take advantage of bits in downloading additional malware. And then we have yet another attack against a water system in the news. This one actually happened end of March 2019, so about two years ago. I don't think it made the news back then. Happened in Kansas and now a person that actually lives in the county where the water system was located was indicted for that breach. In this particular case, the attacker was apparently able to disable a cleaning and disinfection procedure for uh, the water system. And according to the indictment, uh, the intent here was to harm the local population. 
No details in the indictment as to how uh, this particular attack happened or what particular weakness was exploited here. And then another warning that uh, number one, you never should expose your network based storage systems to the internet. And number two, that uh, devices that are no longer supported by the manufacturer tend to be inherently dangerous. QNAP's older devices are vulnerable to two vulnerabilities that uh, do allow remote code execution. One is a direct shell injection vulnerability in the web server or the application running on port 8080 via the web server, and then an arbitrary file write vulnerability in the DLNA server that also may be leverageable to obtain code execution. These devices are no longer updated by QNAP. So your best chance here is to firewall them off and turn off as many features as possible. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.